Hello and welcome to Bias Builders. Today we're thrilled to welcome Sujal Patel and Parag Malik, co-founders of Nautilus Biotechnology, to the show today. Once again, thank you for joining us. And to help host this episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Chris Gatta. To kick things off, Nautilus team, can you share a brief intro with us? Sujal, why don't we start with you? Great. Well, uh, and let me uh, first uh, thank you, Katja and uh, and Chris, for inviting us to the Bios Builders uh, podcast. We really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about ourselves and about Nautilus. So my name is Sujal Patel. I am one of the two founders of Nautilus and the CEO. I am a longtime entrepreneur. The last, last entrepreneurial journey uh, that I was on was actually a tech company, not a biotech company like Nautilus is. It was a tech company founded uh, in 2001, and it was focused in the data storage arena. At the time, this was a world where text-based data was the predominant type of data and storage systems were never really built for videos and images and machine-generated data. And we built a purpose-built architecture for that world and we sold it into a wide range of environments from media entertainment companies to internet streaming companies, um, overlapping in terms of my focus today. In the biotech world, we did a lot of work with companies in next generation sequencing and biomedical research. And we grew that company very nicely. We took it public in 2006, we grew it um, to the point where we could sell it for $2.6 billion in 2010. And after that part of my journey, I really was focused on trying to find a new project that was more impactful, more directly related to human impact. And I was really only thinking about the improvement of healthcare and, and clean energy with the goal of trying to make a dent in, in the climate change that's afflicting the planet. And I hadn't come up with anything for many years as I was searching and trying to find that right thing. And it was interesting. I met Parag, my co-founder here at Nautilus, who'll introduce himself in a minute, something along the lines of 15 or 16 years ago. He was a big customer of mine in my last company. I got to know him well. And when he went to Stanford about a decade ago to start a new lab sitting at the intersection of computing and biochemistry and data science, my wife and I were so impressed with him and the work that he was doing in precision medicine that we've been philanthropically supporting his Stanford lab for about a decade now, actually continuously for a decade. And so Parag and I built a close relationship. And in 2016, he came to me with the idea behind this company. I'm going to pass the story to him to help kind of tie together his background in the company. But it, I immediately knew in an hour when he described this to me that this is a technology that could be potentially world changing. And if anyone ever brought me an idea like this, I would have said, hey, Parag, what do you think? Because you're the smartest guy I know. And here it is, Parag's bringing me the idea. And it was very, very quickly that we got together and joined forces. And we've been at it now for more than five years and we've really made a substantial amount of progress. And we're excited to tell you about it. Parag, why don't I kick it over to you and let you describe your background and pick that story up a little. Super, thanks, 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 Sujal. Thank you also, also uh, both for having us today. Um, my own background is, is as, as Fujil mentioned, I, I'm really uh, spanning multiple worlds. I'm trained as both a computer scientist and a biochemist, did my graduate work with David Eisenberg at UCLA, and my postdoc with Rudy Ebersold at the Institute for Systems Biology um, before starting, starting the first lab uh, in Los Angeles. And my lab's really focused at the intersection of precision medicine and bringing a variety of different data modalities Different, different omics, different other types of measurements, nano-based measurements together to try to do a better job of answering fundamental questions about how can we diagnose cancers earlier? How can we do a better job of predicting who's likely to respond to one therapy or another? And to uncover the mechanisms under the hood of that. And it was really through those studies and those efforts of seeing just how powerful the technologies we had on the genomic side were and struggling to find parity with a lot of the proteomics technologies when we were doing these large integrative studies that, that was a backdrop for Nautilus of really trying to think about how can we do proteomics better? How can we do proteomics differently to ultimately bring it into parity with genomics? Thanks so much for those intros, that guys. And uh, before we dive in a little deeper, Sujal, can you provide a brief intro uh, to Nautilus for us? Sure, I'd be happy to. So 
Nautilus is a company that I truly believe is going to revolutionize biomedicine. And the area of focus for us is what's called proteomics. Proteomics is the study of proteins, whether they be in cells, your body, or any organism. And proteins are the most valuable source of biological insight. They make up all of your cells. They do all of the work in your body. And unlike the genome, which is really static, it really doesn't change from the day you're born to the day you die. Your proteins are dynamic. Your proteins define what's going on. Are you sick? Are you healthy? Are you responding to a drug? And because of that, the ability to measure proteins is critical for development of effective drugs in a cost-efficient way. It's critical for precision medicine to decide which therapy I should give you or therapeutic response monitoring to determine if a therapy is working. And, you know, to underscore that statement, think about this, you know, over 90% of our FDA approved drugs target proteins. Most of our molecular diagnostics target proteins. And unlike the genome, where measurement is a commodity today, I can take a drop of blood from Chris, I can put it on a genomic sequencer and for $1,000 in a day, I tell you what 99% of your genome is and it's easy. Any lab in the world can do that. For the proteome, we could not be further from that. The proteome, the best techniques on the planet, I could take that same drop of blood. And if I want to know what are the proteins in that drop of blood, I could spend a month going through a very complicated set of sample preparation, running it through an instrument called the mass spectrometer, which essentially takes pieces of proteins and weighs them, and then complex bioinformatics to reassemble all that data to attempt to identify what's in that sample. And the best the world can do after all of that work, maybe spending thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, the best we can do is identify about eight or 9% of the proteins that are in that sample. And the results we get have poor dynamic range, poor sensitivity. And this was the problem that Parag struggled with for his whole career as a key opinion leader in the proteomics world. And Nautilus is bringing a scientific approach that's very novel to, to, to the world in the form of an instrument that takes any sample from any organism in and ultimately, when we deliver it in our fully commercial form at the end of 2023, enables you to get upwards of 95% identification of the proteins in a routine push button manner so that we can enable any scientist in any lab in the world who wants to get a proteome to access a proteome and to leverage this unique data for the improvement of drug development, precision medicine, and diagnostics. Awesome. And Parag, to expand on that a little bit, at a high level, can you tell us more about Nautilus's approach to proteomics and the platform that you guys are building? Absolutely. I, th I think maybe perhaps the best way to think about Nautilus's platform is in the context of existing approaches and, and just what's, what's different. And if you look at proteomics today, there, there are really two big approaches that are prevalent. One is mass spectrometry, as Sujil mentioned. And the other are, are, are protein assays and arrays, things like ELISA's. Um, and for uh, both of those techniques, they're both bulk measurements. They measure many, 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 many protein molecules and uh, generate either a, a brightness or an intensity that is related to how much is there. Uh, Nautilus's platform, and in particular with things like ELISA's, the way they work is with very specific affinity reagents, antibodies, that uh, you put a whole bunch of them down on a surface and then try and grab your proteins out of solution and then maybe sandwich them and to get how much is there, you measure a brightness. Now, the challenge with that is that, A, we don't have affinity reagents for every single protein in the proteome. And then B, the range that we might wanna cover, the range of proteins in your cells, in your blood, spans a huge dynamic range there may be proteins like transcription factors that are present in you know, one to five copies per cell that are really, really important, and other proteins that might be present in millions of copies. So how in the world does one measure something down to handfuls of molecules? And that's the root of Nautilus's platform, is saying, all right, we wanna build an incredibly sensitive platform that is able to measure potentially single molecules. So that required us to actually build, build a single molecule counter as a platform. And so the heart of Nautilus's approach is that we literally go through every single molecule in the sample one by one, and we, and we identify them, and then we count them up. 
And the way that we do that involves a mix of nanofabrication and uh, pretty sophisticated bioconjugation chemistry, uh, the development of some novel biochemical reagents, and then also a significant amount of machine learning. And so that combination of specialized hardware as well in the instrument, you know, you put the right hardware together with the right wetware, with the right data science software, and that's, that's really the, the genesis of our approach. Yeah, thanks so much for that intro, guys. It, it sounds fascinating. I'm excited to hear more. And so I'll, I'll pass it off to Chris to dive into some of the details. I was too excited to get started and learn more, guys. Sorry for the interruption, Cage. <laughs> since, since 2016, Nautilus has operated at what you might call the cutting edge of proteomic analysis. And you've been developing tools to derive biological insights to advance precision medicine and diagnostics, just as you've described. So taking a step back, Parag, can you tell us more about the genesis of the invention that kickstarted Nautilus? What was the spark that brought it all together in that first hour that Sujal mentioned earlier? Yeah, well, so, you know, the, the, the genesis of Nautilus started really with having worked in proteomics for a very long time and tried to take existing approaches and improve them. And we've seen a lot of work in this throughout the field of saying, all right, I'm going to improve the sample preparation, or I'm going to improve the mass spectrometer itself and make it faster, for instance, or I'm going to make the data analysis better. And all of those improvements have, have, have pushed the envelope on what those technologies can do. But if you take a step back and you say, all right, well, what do we actually want? If, if you go to the biological community and say, what do you actually want in your proteomics analysis technology? Don't, don't be constrained by what currently exists. And when they come back, they say, well, there are a couple of things. We want it to be very sensitive. We want to be able to measure those single molecules. We want it to have a wide dynamic range because we want to be able to cover both those single molecules and the more abundant things. We want it to be really fast. <laughs> we want to be able to potentially crunch through thousands of samples a day. And we also want it to be easy to use so that anybody can use it. And, and then you look at what's out there and you're like, wow, I have no idea how I would take the current platforms and evolve them to satisfy all of those criteria. And so this problem was churning away in my head for years of how can we, how can we do something substantially different that will satisfy what the, the true needs of the community are. And I, the, the reality of how it, how the inspiration, the genesis, as you said, the, the spark, I, you know, I've been trying to turn over these ideas and thinking about different domains. And, and really what happened is as I was mulling over all of these things, I, I went on a road trip <laughs> and, um, uh, literally started, did, made a one-way rental from Detroit to Denver and went meandering and allowed myself a little bit of freedom to think creatively. And I came out of that, that road trip and the following weekend, I woke up that, that Saturday morning and my wife remembers this very vividly. I, I think I literally woke up and said, oh, that's how you do it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then it was immediately followed by no, that can't possibly work. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then you know, a weekend filled with uh, with doing simulations and muttering to myself, and uh, and came out of that and said, wow, there, there's a way to do this. There is a there's a way. It requires some inversions in our typical thinking. It requires bringing together um, you know, this nano patterning and instrumentation and all of these elements. But at the same time, it also relies on some aspects that are very established. We understand in general, maybe not at the single molecule level, but in general, how to immobilize proteins on solid support. We understand how to probe them with affinity reagents. We understand how to image things. And so taking these concepts and bringing them together in the right way, that was really the key was was drawing inspiration from many pieces, but really starting from the problem rather than starting from what can we do today? 
starting from what do we actually want? And so that was that was really where it came from. And it seems like a good reminder to all of us to occasionally take a break and let our minds relax and think things through. <laughs> Bringing that together, you've had the idea. What brought you together as co-founders? You started yeah. to touch on this earlier. Yeah, well, so I've, I've known Sujal for a really long time. Um, as, as Sujal mentioned, you know, 15 plus years because I was, I was one of his customers uh, in his previous endeavor. And so I've, I've had a tremendous amount of respect for Sujal for a long time. And we've known each other and worked closely together. And, uh, and so soon after having you know, that crazy weekend, um, I spent a little bit of time thinking about what was the right vehicle for bringing this idea into the world where it could do some good. And, you know, I have, I have a lab at Stanford and thought, okay, maybe this is something that we could do in my academic lab, talk to friends who worked at larger companies, maybe license it to a larger company, uh, or do a startup and start off that way. And, um, and so I, I started reaching out to, to people uh, to get advice on a, how to do this right, how to, and uh, as well as to think through what was the right vehicle for getting this out in the world. And um, as I mentioned, I had tremendous respect for Sujal. So I called him up initially, like, hey, Sujal, I, I think I have to go start a company. <laughs> um, uh, how do I not screw it up? <laughs> and um, uh, and Sujal um, you know, was like, well, tell me, tell me a little more about this. What are you talking about? And, uh, uh, and I gave told him in broad strokes um, what I was thinking about. And then we sat down at a whiteboard and walked through everything. And, um, and you know, he challenged me repeatedly saying, well, do you have to do it that way? Or what would, you know, if you had more capital, what would, could you go faster? Um, who cares about this? Is this, you know, you say this is important. Who actually cares about this? And really challenged me to, to understand. And that was just so incredibly valuable. And, uh, and Sujal and I, had this just deep foundational respect and we brought different elements to the table of his experience and how to execute, how to, um, you know, how to run a great company, how to build a great company. Um, and, and then, you know, I brought some of the, the science, scientific side and the, the field and domain expertise. And so it was just an amazing opportunity to get to work together. And I think I'll turn that back over to you now, Sujal. So at Nautilus, and as you've described, you're seeking to deliver on the untapped potential of the human proteome. And yeah. as Parag was saying, one of your questions to him was, well, who, who will really benefit from this? So can you tell us more about, uh, of course, in your own words, how did, how did you come together as co-founders, but also a little bit more about the unmet need in drug development and research that Nautilus is seeking to address? Yeah. So I think first, kind of as a some background, you know, I've gotten to know Prague well for, you know, as Prague mentioned, more than a decade and a half at this point, I think 2004, which is kind of 17 years or something like that. And I've known Prague, in all the time I've known Prague, his lab, um, you know, at Stanford and the one he had prior to that uh, at Cedar Center Medical Center in UCLA, they've, they've been multi omic labs focused on genomics, focused on proteomics. And so my last company gave me a ton of exposure to that space in understanding why proteins are super important. And, you know, that one, that day that Parag called me up, and we spent an hour, and as he described the concept to me, um, I started immediately kind of thinking, first, what I do with any young entrepreneur who comes and says, hey, I have a new idea. I've, I've made about 80 investments in private companies. Some of them have been very, very successful. And there's just like some screens you start with, right? Okay, why did Prague come up with this idea? Well, he knows the customer, he is the customer. Why, why did he come up with it and not someone else? And one of the things I realized very early was that the idea he's describing to me is really counterintuitive. Unless you were thinking both as computer scientist, data scientist, and as a biochemist, you wouldn't have come up with this idea. And that's pretty trendy today. Like there's all oh, companies, I do, ML and AI and bio, and I do this great thing. That's trendy. But Parag has academic degrees in both computer science and biochemistry. This whole career, his entire career has been in the, the intersection of those disciplines. And so he's got this really unique background. And the last question, you know, I asked myself first and foremost was, well, why is this idea timely? Like, why didn't Prague do this 10 years ago? Or why is it going to work now and not in 10 years? 
And one of the things I got to the bottom of in that first hour call is that we're probably just now in the realm of compute power feasibility in the cloud to accomplish what you're trying to do with the number of analytes and the size of an experiment we want to be able to run in a day. And when we did the math, it turned out, yeah, it's probably true. Five years before we started, probably wouldn't have been feasible to have that much compute power. And so for me, I understood why Parag was the right guy to come up with this idea, why he understood the customer and why it was timely. And from there, it's a pretty easy leap for me. I was looking for a new opportunity. Prague is, if not one of, he is the smartest man I know on the planet. And I was like, sure, let's go figure out in six months as we go through the full development of the algorithm and the early work in the lab. And it's like, see, is this a crackpot idea or is this something that really we can build and revolutionize biomedicine? And you know, we have, maybe we'll get to that in the next phase of our story, but that first six months was absolutely confirmatory. Um, you know, we took different roles. Uh, you know, I handled the early company setup and the first fundraise. Parag was in the lab. He was working through some of the hard problems. And I'm a computer scientist as well. So he stuck me with the, the full implementation of the algorithm, which took me about six months. And in all of my spare time, I had to catch up on YouTube on biology, chemistry 101, figure out how to read a research paper, understand it, and then keep building my knowledge. And at the end of that six months, what we realized was not only is this feasible, but it's probably... Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's going to need an incredibly interdisciplinary team, but it's probably less of a lift than we had originally thought because we probably uh, could take some shortcuts along the way that would be able to get us to 95% without as much work as we had originally thought. And so for us, that was the point where we were like, okay, we have to start raising money. We have to start hiring great scientists. We have to start knocking down each of the major pillars of bodies of work where we have to figure out first and research how are we going to solve a problem and then build the development organizations that actually go and build the, you know, whether it be instrumentation or science or an assay or whatever it is. I really can't wait to hear more of those details, especially some of the, some of the early work and what you've reached today. But for now, and you've both touched on this at different points, so feel free either of you to jump in. Why is the proteome important? And how is what Nautilus is doing going to not only enable its access, but connect the proteome to the next stage of medicine, more entering the realm of precision medicine? Yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll start off and then Sujil, you can, uh, you can um, uh, jump in. Uh, so I think it's, it's the, the importance of the proteome starts with understanding what proteins do. So the world has been very heavily focused on the genome um, for the past 20 years. And a lot of that has been because it's measurable. And there are technologies that for, you know, in a couple of days, you can measure the genome and, uh, and get 99.999% of it. Um, but we, when we think about the genome, it's pretty static, even in diseases like cancer. It, um, you know, your genome is the same the day you're born and the day you die. Um, it's the same for a seed as it is for a fully grown plant. Um, and so when we think about understanding health and we think about understanding disease, um, the genome might be able to predict you know, what might possibly happen, but it doesn't have any knowledge of the history of what happened before. And it has a, it cannot be used to tell you what's happening today. And so that, that is encoded in the proteome, right? The proteomes, your proteins are the things that do the work in your cells. They're the signaling molecules that go from one part of your body to another to, to let you know about things. And so it's, they also are constantly changing. They're hugely dynamic. Literally every second of every day, your proteins are changing. And so when we think about understanding health, understanding disease, your proteins are the drivers of that behavior. Uh, and so we need ways to be able to, to profile them. And then when we think about how does this relate to, to pharma, to drug development, and how does better access to the proteome accelerate those things, uh, you know, the first thing to recognize is that 95% of therapeutics target a protein. Um, and the, the key challenges that pharma faces really fall into, say, about three categories. Uh, category one is, what is my target? Uh, you know, what is that protein that is on the cell surface of disease cells and not present in the rest of your healthy tissues? Uh, 
Um, and right now, if you're only getting a small snapshot of what might be there, then you, you're not necessarily looking at the most important proteins. You're not necessarily looking at the most differential proteins. That, um, so that's part one is just finding, finding the best targets. Part two is downstream when you know, you've got a target and you're doing, uh, doing development mechanism of action studies to understand how a candidate therapeutic works um, what pathways is it activating? What other proteins? How does that potentially cross-react with other tissues? How does it do it over time? What are the patient populations that this works on and it doesn't? Um, understanding those protein signaling pathways is definitionally looking at the protein. Uh, and so that's place two is really how can we, how can we make it faster and more effect, efficient to understand what each potential therapeutic candidate is doing when is it working? How is it working? Uh, and then I'd say the third third piece where proteins are, are super relevant is really on the diagnostics and prognostic side of being able to take a drop of blood and say, you know, some, this person has cancer, um, right? The, our, our prevalent biomarkers today are things like PSA, CA125, that, uh, and being able to dig deeper and find those proteins that are shed from a tumor um, as early as possible. Um, to find those proteins that are indicative and say, oh, somebody recently had disease activity, uh, or you should really take this therapeutic, it's likely to work. So across the continuum, um, there's a really important role for being able to quickly and easily and comprehensively study the proteome. And that's really the gap was that right now it's, it's, it's hard. It requires specialized expertise. And as Sujal mentioned, you're not measuring everything. You're, you're measuring this tiny percentage of what's there. So. Um, I'm sorry, it's muted. <laughs> Sujal, I just was curious if you wanted to add anything further. I think Parag gave us a great overview. No, I think, yeah, I think Parag's answer was very complete. I think I'll leave it with him. All right. Well, Bringing this back to something you both said earlier about how Nautilus brings together hardware, software, and wetware. As you integrate innovations across all of these disciplines that are fundamental to your proteomics platform and approach, um, how, how have you been finding that process? What has it been like building the team? You mentioned the first six months were a whirlwind. I, I guess we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, maybe I'll start and then we'll let Parag kind of chime in. I think, you know, first and foremost, like, I just want to recognize how interdisciplinary the team is that we have to build. I mean, we have biologists working with chemists, working with single molecule biophysicists. They work with optical engineers, nanofabrication engineers, chip specialists, software engineers. And we have to integrate all of this into an instrument where every time a sample comes in, you push a button and the answer comes out the other side. And that's a, that's a really complex task. And, you know, there are a set of things that you have to do in order to be successful at that. First and foremost, you have to hire really great people in each of those different disciplines, because not only do they have to be great at what they're doing, they have to understand where is my work end and where does someone else's work begin? What's the interface of that work? Um, you know, Parag always said that a lot of the difficulties in building this technology and bringing it out to the world is going to be at the interface between the disciplines. Where does the imaging meet with the single molecule biophysicists and how many photons we're getting off of the, off of the binding event that we're detecting? How are we going to go and be able to get the data off the instrument and get it into the cloud in an effective way and then use machine learning to go and produce the analysis? What are we going to do? with the surface chemistry on our chips so that we have solid attachment of our proteins on the substrate. You have to pay really careful attention to those interfaces, making sure that people are communicating across those interfaces, making sure there's a, a structure and a culture in place where all those people are working well with each other. And people have to have the mindset that's you know very different than a big company. There aren't lanes, right? In a big company, everyone's like, oh, stay in your chemistry lane, stay in your 
optical lane. It'll all work in the end. That's, there's no lanes at this company. Everyone has to be thinking across the entire product in order to have a complete picture and figure out how my work impacts the next person's work and how this comes together to deliver. And on day one that an employee shows up at this company, they walk through, I think, a 200-page science slide deck so that they understand the entire end-to-end -end system. And then we narrow into where their piece is and what are the important interfaces. And that's just super critical to reinforce that right away and then to make sure that you're setting up a culture and communication that allows you to have all these disciplines working well together successfully. And, you know, I think that's that's a huge part of our success uh, and, and our future success is our ability to execute on that well. Yeah, I mean, I think the I'll just I'll second Sujil's, Sujil's comments, which is that uh, when you're working on a challenge this large, um, one of the really special aspects of the startup is that everybody talks to everybody, and you don't have those big silos that prevent you from um, you know, really having the person who's in the weeds thinking about the chip chatting with the person who's in the weeds thinking about the reagents and that flexibility that ability to move quickly and with urgency and to um, try things and fail them quickly and move on to the next thing uh, those are those are really critical in an early stage company and particularly an interdisciplinary one having the humility to say yeah you know what i'm an expert i've been doing chip fabrication for 30 years but you know what, I don't actually know a lot about proteins. And so there's something I can learn from that person who just finished college and being excited to learn and share um, has been a really central part of, of our culture as well. That's exactly actually the next point I was hoping to hear a little more about. You've talked about bringing these people together and honestly what I wouldn't give to see that 200 slide deck that you mentioned, Sujil. But I'd just be curious to understand when you're bringing people together from so many different backgrounds and you're trying to build a company culture around it, have you faced any challenges building such diverse teams and bringing them together? Or how have you been thinking about defining that company culture? Um, maybe Sujil, do you want to start off with that and then I'll, I'll add on? Sure. I mean, I think that when you think about trying to bring together such a diverse group of people from different disciplines, I think you first have to kind of fall back onto like, what do you want these people to value? What are their cultural attributes, right? Things like you need people who are open and honest communicators, people who are really low ego. We, we've put on our website that we have a no a-holes rule. A-holes are a huge impediment to this kind of open culture that allows you to have the collaboration you need to put all of these different disciplines together. We look for people that are really team oriented, who are ready to tackle whatever problem is in front of them, whether it's their problem or it's their peers problem. And those sort of cultural attributes are really, really important to us. And they are screening criteria for who we hire. And then we are constantly reinforcing them. We walk through their value, the, the company's values and philosophies on day one when they get hired. We walk through it again at our new hire training, which they do with the two founders every month. Um, we do them in cohorts. We talk about them a lot in our all hands meetings. We always wanna be reinforcing those attributes. And I think that's really critical. And one of the things I think that's, that's also critical is that you have to be cognizant of the fact that the, job market and your visibility as a company and how the world sees you, that changes dramatically as you go through the type of five-year journey that we've been on. And so you have to be cognizant of taking advantage of cycles, right? We are in a cycle right now where going public and having all of this interest in proteomics has driven a huge amount of interest in jobs at Nautilus. And so we're trying to figure out how do we take advantage of that to source even better candidates than we could the year before? How do we go and use that, that momentum to then go and reach for a candidate that wasn't available? And then figuring out how you do that, how you integrate those people and how you get them to become your advocates. That's, that's a virtuous cycle that I found super successful in the past, but you really have to be intentional and mindful as you're looking for those types of dynamics out there. 
Yeah, I guess just a one one other point. You have to make some hard choices um, because you meet lots of really smart people, and to say, you know what? Yeah, we want smart people, but you know what? That's not enough. You have to you have to be a person who recognizes that your success comes from the success of everyone else around you. You have to be, as Sujil mentioned, a great communicator and um, and honest and open and transparent and really have a deep respect for collaboration. Uh, you have to understand that collaboration doesn't mean that you talk and everyone listens. It also doesn't mean you always get your way, right? It means that you come to the table, everybody's input is given and, um, you know, Sometimes you don't disagree with you don't agree with the outcome, and that's okay, right? That's um, those are those are hard lessons, and those are those are hard screening criteria. But we've been really fortunate to to be able to say we want not just really smart, talented people, but we also require <laughs> all of these other attributes, and that's a high bar. Um, so I'd say the other, other key aspect there is, is just reinforcing and supporting all of those um, is, 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 is critical. Um, so. Yeah, and to chime in on what Prox said, I mean, reinforcing and supporting is such a big part of it. And you, you have to be very startup-minded when you're doing that. Um, you know, I've been the startup CEO now for more than two decades. And I have said numerous times in interviews with people over the last couple of weeks and with team members today, you know, we as a company, we have ambitious goals next year. And the path to get from here to the accomplishing those goals, it's not really visible. We have faith that all the pieces are there. We have faith we're doing all the right things and we have all the right people. And I have lots of experience that when you have those things, you'll get there. But if you see the path today, then we're moving too slow because someone else who doesn't see the path is going to move faster and they're going to eat our lunch. And that is such a, such a unique concept that so many of our uh, employees who haven't been through this type of high growth startup experience have never really internalized. And, you know, just saying it out loud, like, hey, I don't see the path. I have faith the path is there because of these things and we're going to be on the path. But if we did see the path, you know, we'd be some giant company. We'd be a company that has 50,000 employees and is going on that path and it's going to take 10 years or 20 years. And it's not going to take 10 or 20 years here. I mean, our full commercial launch is seven years after find, founding and that's less than two years away. And, and I guess just one last point on this, because I think it's an important lesson as well. Um, when, when you look around at many companies hiring philosophies, it's very much of, I need a person who knows X, has done it for 10 years or whatever, and is, you know, I need them to fit into this hole and do this thing. Um, and, and our philosophy, from our mindset, that is hiring on floor, right? That's what somebody knows coming into the role. Uh, that is not our hiring philosophy at Nautilus. At Nautilus, we hire on ceiling. We hire on people who are high potential, who, have these key characteristics we talked about around humility, around learning and growing, and with the expectation that the things we're doing inside the company are so unusual that, frankly, it would be very surprising if there were anybody in the world who had a decade of experience in it. So you need people who are really excited about growing and, um, and have tremendous potential and uh, are excited to, to get there. So hiring on ceiling, not floor, I think has been a really critical part of how we've gotten to where we are. Passing it back to you, Cage. I know I love that mindset and I'm excited to hear how it's contributed to uh, the challenges you've overcome and the accomplishments you've achieved thus far. Yes. So both of you guys have started touching on how good entrepreneurship is so much more than having an interesting idea or interesting, an interesting technology. And launching a company is never easy, particularly when you're scaling to go public so quickly. So I'm really interested to hear in the last five years, what have been the greatest challenges that the two of you have faced? 
You want to start, Prague, and then I'll chime in? Sure. I mean, been, I'd say uh, there have been very different challenges at very different phases. Right? So, you know, in the very first phase of the company, as, as Sujil mentioned, it was really about, is this a crackpot idea uh, or not? <laughs> and, uh, and really doing the hard work to, you know, people call it de-risking. It's really about understanding the feasibility of the approach and what is needed and how easy or hard is it and quantifying that uh, in a way that is concrete. Uh, you know, I'd say growing the team as we've talked about is a substantial challenge and building a great company, a great culture, or great, bringing a great group of people that is, you know, companies defined by the people in it. <laughs> And so that's a huge challenge. Uh, you know, there was a pretty practical challenge that was very substantial uh, right around March, April, 2020. Uh, it turns out that being right in the middle slash beginning of a fundraise, uh, the day that shelter in place is announced um, makes for an exciting fundraise. <laughs> Um, when the stock market collapses 30% and no one knows what's going to happen and the uncertainty in the world um, creates really interesting conditions. Um, so that was, that was definitely a challenge. And, um, and, and then I'd say you know, a, a key challenge, which uh, is, is always going to be focus. Um, you move quickly and it, with pace. Some of it comes from working hard, you know, putting in the extra mile, a lot of it comes from making smart choices and being efficient with where you're expending your effort. Um, and so those, making those decisions in, you know, under uncertainty, making them quickly and, uh, and not getting too attached to things that might be shiny and cool, but don't move you forward. Those have been some of the really key challenges that we've had to be cognizant of every day. Yeah, what, what I would add to that is, you know, for, for me, the first thing in a startup is go figure out how are you going to solve some problem in the world that's critical to a customer and have a solution that's 10 times better than everything else that's out there. And once you actually have something that is 10 times better, and you execute well, everything else falls in place. You build an efficient go-to-market that doesn't cost a whole lot of money. You figure out how to scale rapidly. You figure out how to build product extensions. You build close relationships with customers and you know what to do next. So first and foremost, you have to do that. And we have that at Nautilus. Once you have that, it requires a ton of passion and perseverance to get to your end goal. For us, you know, we have to develop a attachment chemistry to create a hyperdense, uniform array of molecules. We went through while we were in research countless techniques and we tried one and no, that's a dead end. Let's go to the next one. That's a dead end. Let's talk to some people. Let's talk to our scientific advisory board. What if we did it this way? No. And then finally we created a scheme that worked well and then we made one that's even better. And that same sort of thing occurred in various places. You know, we have to make signals that are really bright because we have to detect a single molecule binding event. Well, how do you do that and still have a lot of speed? Because normally to be bright, you have to go slow. If you're not bright, you have to go slow. Well, we developed a scheme finally after persevering for years and we published that. It was our first publication in scientific reports. And then guess what? It was great, but we built a better scheme and we never told the world about it because it's a really good scheme. But that kind of perseverance is incredibly important. And then you have to recognize like, where am I in that step? Okay, I have a method now that I am confident is what I can ship with. What's the next set of team members that I need to develop the SOPs to solidify what we're doing and figure out how we scale it up? And, you know, over the last year, I've been incredibly proud of Nautilus's team and Parag in, in identifying the right time for those moments with each of the major pieces of our solution and, and getting to scale up and bringing in the development mind and manufacturing minded folks. And it really has put us in a great position as we enter 2022. But I, I know a lot of our listener, listeners are either in the process of or thinking about building their own companies. And so I think they'd be really curious to hear, you know, 
what have you learned as you face these challenges or what are the things you'd wish you'd known when you started out on this adventure? Prague, I'm going to let you start with that one. <laughs> um, well, I'd say number one, um, and I, I will say in addition to Nautilus, I've also worked with different VC firms and evaluated potential um, investments as well. And so some of the advice that I would give comes from, from both my experiences inside Nautilus and that experience evaluating. Um, a lot of times I see companies coming from academic groups um, where there's some, again, shiny, cool technology, like really amazing, does nifty things, but doesn't actually have a market. Uh, and so I'd say starting with something that isn't just cool, <laughs> but is something that there's a huge community need for, something that there's a huge want for, that's you know, important in advancing um, the world. Um, I think that the, it has become really clear through Nautilus what we're working on is really important. And that has made the process of how we communicate that, how we recruit, um, how we fundraise, all of it comes down to, all right, well, that's great, but who, you know, who's gonna use it? Who's gonna buy it? Why are they gonna buy it? Um, all of those questions need to be answered and really clearly. And so that number one, just, just how critical that is, that it's, it's not about how cool your tech is, it's about how useful <laughs> it is. Um, that's number one that I've learned. I'd, I'd say the other thing that I learned that you know Sujil was was probably well aware of, but I, I it was it was new to me, uh, which is that at different phases in the company, there are very different skill sets that are required. So when you're in the early phase of a company, and you know that's not to say that some that that people can't transition and pick up and expand their skill sets, but there, there are often folks who are really good at, uh, you know, playing fast and loose and moving really quickly and trying lots of stuff and dealing with lots of crazy and uncertainty. And those people are able to evolve product and evolve research very, very quickly. On the other hand, those often are not the same people who can sit there and optimize a buffer condition by 0.1 increments till it is perfect and manufacturable. Both really important skill sets in having a product but quite different mindset, quite often quite different people and needed at different phases in the company. And so the evolution there, I think was a big lesson for me as, as well as the other thing that I've seen is that as our company has grown and it's um, become more established that, that the profile and who we're able to recruit and the types of people has also evolved. And so um, just being aware of that, that, I think Prague, those are a really good set of things. And your the first part of your talk track highlighted that you have to build something that's 10x better. The one thing I would add there for every entrepreneur out there in any market is the next thing you have to do is you have to go pressure test that against customers and recognize that Prague and I are biased. Whatever the customer says, we're going to hear it in the absolute best light. So think about how am I going to take their feedback critically? How am I going to question myself? Well, is what I think is important really important? Is that really a primary buying criteria? Is that nice to have or is that something the customer absolutely has to have? You must get that right because if you don't, everything afterward is gonna become really, really hard. And I've been involved with many companies where the advantage may only be 50% better or 2X better. And that means you still may get to a $100 million run rate and have a great company, but it's a huge slog and it's really, really hard. You wanna make sure you get that right first. And then the next thing is, I really think entrepreneurs have to focus on getting the very best team together. And the very best team is not, I have the best resumes. It's the best team that works together. It's the team that's going to function from a collaboration perspective. It's a team that is all full of sellers, right? If you want to hire a new person, you have to be selling. Why is this a great opportunity? Everyone has to be able to present about, you know, why is this company a great opportunity? Why is it going to change the world? And so you've really got to focus on that team. 
team building for me at Nautilus was a huge part of my last five years. There are numerous examples um, where I may have hired recruiters for particular jobs and they'd present slate after slate of finalists and I said no to all of them. And in one case, Nick Nelson is my chief business officer. I chased after him for a full year. I turned my search off because after I met Nick, who wouldn't interview with us, I was like, that's the guy. And I spent a year recruiting him until I, until I got him to join. And he's awesome. I love Nick Nelson. Um, like it takes a lot of tenacity and a lot of, a lot of intentionality to go build a team like that. And you've got to focus on that because even if you have errors, even if some assumptions don't hold up, your team will get you through it, but they've got to be right. They've got to be motivated and they've got to work well with each other. Awesome, guys. I think that's some great advice for both current and aspiring entrepreneurs. But rounding off our conversation on challenges and switching to uh, some of Nautilus's triumphs, in June 2021, Nautilus went public via SPAC. Sujal, can you tell us a little bit more about that experience and also a little bit more about the increasingly prevalent topic? What led you to SPAC instead of a traditional IPO? Yeah, I mean, so... It's a, it's a great question. I, I'm, you know, I'm a former public company CEO. Last company was, you know, traditional IPO, the standard way. And that was my bias. And my bias was, let's build the product. Let's get it out there. Let's have some revenue and let's go public. And um, I was honestly quite anti-SPAC because SPAC to me looked like shell companies. I've been around long enough in the 80s, shell companies were considered to be kind of taboo, right? Um, but one of the things I realized as I started to um, look at that world is that, you know, these SPACs are all different. Every SPAC is different from the other SPAC. And in our Series B, we brought on board Perceptive Advisors, who is well regarded as one of the top one or two life sciences hedge funds in the country. And they are a prolific SPAC sponsor. They've done five of them at this point. And, you know, um, one of our board members, as I was starting to think about another fundraise because there was so much interest to put money in our company, even though we hadn't even started spending our last series B, people were ready to put in more. And so I was thinking about going out on a fundraise and, you know, my board member from Perceptive said, Hey, have you thought about this SPAC opportunity? And, you know, here are the advantages to it. It's a faster route to the public markets. There's much greater visibility as a public company, which helps with recruiting and customers and partners. You can raise more capital in a single transaction in a single event, and you can get a great brand name set of long-term healthcare focused investors. And the story sounds great, but I was like, I always thought to myself, well, that's not what A-plus companies do. And what my board member from Perceptive described to me is, hey, look, we don't do this to enrich ourselves. We don't have big promotes and warrants and all this stuff. We do this because we want to write very large checks, 50, 60 plus million dollar checks into companies we love. And we can't do that with a traditional IPO. And I literally, like, I heard him say that and I looked at their S1 and read it late at night. And I looked at what a deal might look like. And I said, were you thinking something like this? And that was it. He, that one email set the ball in motion. He was on the phone with Barag and I the next morning. We were negotiating by another day after that. And by the weekend, we were, we had a deal agreed. And it was a great, it was a great deal for us. Bringing 350 million into the company gives us the capital that we need to complete our development and get this technology into commercialization. It provides us the ability to de-risk our path because we can invest more in um, our own initiatives and external relationships. And it really, as a public company, has given us access to much better talent and that, that we have been able to feel the impact of being a public company. And as you probably know, many of our peers in the proteomics world have become public as part of this you know, last year's uh, you know, good market climate. And with that, we certainly didn't want to be out of position and have a smaller balance sheet or not be public. And so for us, it was a really, really great opportunity to get out. We were ready for it. I, you know, I just completed my 18th um, earnings call as a public company CEO. I think that's the number. And so, uh, you know, we, we're really happy that we did it. And I think it's really going to put our company in a, in a position of strength as we go through 2022 and 2023. Awesome. Thanks so much. I think that's some great insight, not only on Nautilus' story, but you know, when a SPAC might, might sense for other companies as well. But 
now that we have a pretty good idea of where Nautilus is today and your story so far, um, we'd love to ask both of you what's what's coming next, both for proteomics and for Nautilus. Yeah, I mean, I'll start off there, which is, uh, I think, the, the phase we're in right now is, is really what we call our partnership phase. So you know, we have instruments in the building that are running all the time, and uh, we wanted, we, we recognize there's a, there's a gap between having instruments in the building that are you know, prototypes and having something that you can ship to a customer. But at the same time, you can use them to do important biology. And so to help bridge that, we develop this multi-phase rollout strategy where step one is partner with folks like Genentech and Amgen and, and others to help them ask and answer important questions. And that's really what our, our plan is over the course of this coming coming year through 2023 is to, is to continue expanding our partnerships, helping people use our prototype instrumentation. You know, they mail samples, we analyze them and collaboratively work with them to interpret and uh, um, as a way to build towards 2023 when we launch our commercial instrument um, that people will be able to put into their own labs. And so that, that, that ramp, that's, that's the immediate. And then once we actually have instruments in people's labs that we anticipate being really transformative, people being able to routinely interrogate whole proteomes and deep proteiforms um, in a way that they haven't been able to do before. So, um, you know, I, I, my anticipation is that as it becomes easier and easier and easier to collect more and more better, more complete, more comprehensive, more sensitive proteomics data, that we're going to see that manifest over time as it becomes easier to find those good targets. It becomes easier and faster to get therapeutics through the, the workflow and the pipeline. Um, so I think over the course of the next five to 10 years, you're going to start seeing those coalescences uh, alongside advances, things like DeepMind, where we're getting you know, now protein structures for everything alongside uh, quantitative proteomics information. So to my perspective, we really are in a renaissance of, of proteins and proteomics right now. And, uh, and it's the next, the next decade is going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, I think Parag, Parag said it well. If I'm to sum up what he said, in the long term, proteomics is going to revolutionize biomedicine. It will dramatically improve our understanding of cell biology. And with that will come a wave of better, more effective drugs that are built faster and cheaper. With that will come the ability to select drugs appropriately for a patient based on their proteins and how their body's functioning. With that will come better technologies to monitor how your drugs are working, whether you should switch from therapy A to therapy B. You know, over the course of the last, you know, 15 years, we've had a genomics revolution and it's dramatically expanded our knowledge of how life works, but it hasn't made a huge, huge dent in a lot of the areas that we think proteomics will make a dent in drug discovery and precision medicine. And so for me, I look out 10 years and I'm thinking, boy, it'll be amazing to see what this impact will be. And, um, you know, Prague and I are on this journey to try to help bring this to the world so that we can we can go and try to make a make a dent. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. This has been some fantastic insight, and I've really enjoyed walking through Nautilus' story with you too. Uh, before we go, I'll pass it back to Chris for some closing thoughts. So we've touched on this a few at a few points here, and you've both given phenomenal advice to founders over the course of our conversation. But Parag, with you as the head of the Malik Lab at Stanford and Sujul now having been a CEO of startups for, as you said, I think around two decades, you both came to entrepreneurship from different starting points and even originally different industries. What advice would you share with current or future founders looking to start the next breakout biotech? Sujul, why don't you go first? You know, I think that um, for folks that aspire to be biotech entrepreneurs, put yourself in a position where you can go and observe a problem that's dramatically impacting a customer who's trying to do good in the world and go figure out how can I make that problem better? 
how could I think about that problem differently? How do I leverage my experience to bring to bear on this problem? And then when you figure it out, go pressure test it, go ask lots of people to think about the problem with you. And then if you think you've got something you want to go after, you have to just go and, and do it, right? To me, the entrepreneurial journey is one of the most fun and fulfilling things that I've ever done in my life. And so, you know, I'd encourage people to be careful about making sure they do the prep work, but when they, when they figure something out and they want to go make an impact on the world, go do it. I think that's, that's really great advice to Joel. I'd say my, my advice, um, would be to, you know, there's a, there's a, it's, it's a lot of effort and it's a lot of dedication and a lot of focus starting a company. Um, and there's definitely a feeling of, oh, oh I need to, uh, you hear from a lot of entrepreneurs, oh, I need to, you know, sell this or sell that or, you know, really work it. And, and I think echoing Sujil's comments, if you're working on something important, if you're working on something that matters, um, you don't have to sell it. <laughs> it. It's just, you just have to share and teach and explain. And it's a lot easier. Um, like work on something that actually matters. Um, and I'd say the other part is uh, to, to really come at it from a place of humility um, that, you know, for myself coming from being a professor at a, at a good institution, uh, you know, there are many skills and things that I've learned, but there are also, you know, Sujil brings so much in terms of understanding the market and understanding fundraising and execution and product and uh, recognizing your strengths, but also your limitations and realizing that you don't have to do this alone, that the best thing you can do is build a great team around you, get your ego out of the way and just build the best team you can. That's really great advice. Uh, before we come to a close, do you have any other thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? How can they learn more about your work? Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll start on that in terms of how you can learn more about our work and then some closing thoughts here. Um, so uh, one, how can you learn more about our work? Our website, nautilus.bio, is a great place to start. Uh, on the website, you'll find a description of our technology and you'll find uh, investor presentation on there. In addition to that, um, we have a couple of papers published on BioArchive and we'll continue to add papers to BioArchive as preprints for our publications, which describe in much more detail how our science works. Um, we're a public company now, so you could look at our filings, you could look at our earnings calls and learn more about us. And then, you know, if there's interest in collaboration or partnership or working, all of those links are available on our website, and we'd welcome those conversations. You know, in terms of parting thoughts for me, I just I, I just want to thank the two of you for uh, hosting this event and be and and doing this. All opportunities to talk about entrepreneurship, talk about companies, will help us to foster the next generation of entrepreneurs. And you know, as I mentioned, I've invested in eighty something um, private companies, and. I really enjoy meeting entrepreneurs and talking to them. I find a ton of energy in the innovative work that they do. And I really appreciate the work that the two of you are doing to help foster that in our, you know, greater community in the country. Yeah, I think that's a really great parting message. I'll, I'll, I'll just echo Sujil's, Sujil's sentiment and say thank you again. Uh, it's really been fun chatting with, chatting with you both. and. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about the future of proteomics and, um, and I think the, it's going to be a fun, fun ride the next, the next decade as proteomics becomes ubiquitous. Thank you both, Sujil and Parag. We're incredibly excited for the future of proteomics, as you say, and also for Nautilus driving that way forward. Thank you again for such a fantastic episode. We're very grateful for your time and we're sure our audience will be craving for more.